Father, how much we love you, how much we praise you. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can open your word and listen for your voice, Lord, and we'll hear you if we'll listen with our hearts, Lord. We love you a lot. Help me to stay out of the way, Lord. And in this passage, Lord, show us your glory. Show us your faithfulness, Lord. In this passage, show us how we are as a church to interact with one another. We love you a lot. We trust in you. Thank you for your instruction through your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, say it out loud. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 is kind of where we were at before we were so rudely interrupted by a virus that slowed us down a little bit. Back in the Word of God, back into verse by verse teaching through the Word of God. And our study takes us to 1 Timothy chapter 5. If you remember, this book is written uh, to a young pastor. They're in Ephesus. It is, a, it is really the, the go-to town for Christianity is Ephesus. Tim will be their pastor. Uh, Paul will spend at least three years there. Uh, it's it's, it's his, one of his favorite towns because he spends most time there. John the Apostle will end up being their pastor and will die there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, will hang out there and her tomb is there uh, to this day is where she was buried. So Ephesus. And so as Timothy is there, this is in the early days of Ephesus, as Timothy is there, Paul is writing this letter to this young pastor saying, this is the way to have church. This is who the leaders you're to raise up. This is how you're to interact with one another. And when we get to chapter five, what he's doing is saying, this is some of the inward workings of the church. Because understand this, guys, and boy, we know this more than ever. If we didn't know it, we know it now, is this, is the church is a family. We're family. And you know that because you miss family members. You don't miss, can I say this to you? You don't really miss relatives that much. You don't miss relatives. There. There's some relatives we got in our life that I don't really miss them. I see them on Facebook. I go, oh yeah, that's why we don't live in California. All right, just saying. All right, so we live in Utah. So, there's, so it's, we're not relatives. We're family. And there is a difference between that. And Jesus told us, he says, a new commandment that I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this, all men, and you know this, this, this scripture right here, all men know you are my disciples if you do what? If you love one another. That is the backbone of the church. That is really the church. And you realize how much love there is is when we are separated like this in, in this time of quarantine and we're, we're separated for just a short time. Someday we're gonna be all eternity together. And I love our Wednesday night study as we're talking about the book of Revelation. We are going to be home one day. It won't be long. We'll be in his presence. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, and Lord's going to help us. I want to cover this entire chapter. Don't be, don't be even thinking about that I'm not going to be able to do it. If I don't do it, I can't blame it on you because you're not here. So this is my, my issue. All right, so here's what happens. Is the Apostle Paul, again, is writing to this young pastor, and he's giving him instruction for those in his church. He says this, look at verse one. He says, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Young men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in absolute, in all, ESV, absolute NIV, in absolute purity. How do we interact with one another in the family? Well, the older men, he says, encourage the older man, okay, um, you need to not rebuke them, encourage them. Why? Because as I get older, I understand this verse a lot more. Because you young guys, listen, you want to tell me how I'm supposed to live my life? I got bunions on my feet that are older than you, all right? So you young guys, you don't need to be telling me anything. You need to be praying for me. You need to be praying for the older people, all right? You don't be rebuking an older man. That, out of that line, out of that little section right there, that's the one that I can resonate with because you rebuke an old man, don't do that. Encourage him as a father. So encourage us. We need encouraging, okay? Here's the thing is that the younger men as brothers, notice this, the older, women, the older, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in absolute, I like that word better. It says in all purity, but in absolute purity, this is family. This is family. We take care of one another. We help one another. We see now that one another as a family. I, I never, can I, let me think, this, I ought to think this stuff through before I throw, just throw it out there. All right. Okay, so here's the thing, is this, is that my brother, my physical brother, uh, all growing up, and there was a large, there was a long time that we didn't get along so well, all right? And, and some of it was my fault, some of it was just being stupid and all that. Uh, but he was always my brother. 
He was always my brother. I would have, even in the, the we're friends now, but even in that era of where we didn't like each other and really didn't talk to each other, even in that era, I would have died for him because he's my brother. I would have done anything. He could have called me at any time and said, brother, I need your help. And I would have been there right there for him, even though we didn't like each other at that point. I showed up at his house at times. Uh, at, a, at one of big events, I showed up at his house, not invited, went anyways. Hey, you're my brother. You can't throw me out. I'm here and I love you. Okay, and now, now we're friends. Why do I say that? It's because I want to take out my brother if he watches this. No, he never watches this. But why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we're family. Even when you don't get along, I got your back, you got my back. And we're not always going to be, we're not always going to get along. You're always, there's going to be times that you're going to be wrong and I'm going to be right and you're just going to have to deal with it. All right, so there's not, we're not always going to get along. But the thing is this, is there were always family. We always have each other's back. Lord, help us in that. Help us in that. So here he's saying this, the family, older men, older women, younger men, younger women, this is how we interact as a family. Now, uh, honor, look at verse, look at the next verse. Uh, Honor widows. Show respect for widows. Now, we'll have to, as I go through this, I'll have to give you the context of this. It was a different time back then, but the principles are still the same. The honor is still the same. Taking care of one another is still the same. Um, but let's go through this. Honor widows who are truly widows, who are truly widows. But if a woman has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to show godliness, that's a cool little line right there, I'll come back to that, to their own households and to make, and make some returns to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. He says they need to learn, first of all, to put their, relig their religion into practice. Again, another one of your translations says that. Put your religion into practice. What is he saying here? He's saying families take care of families. We take care of one another, and in the family, mothers and fathers and kids, we take care of one another. We've kind of disconnected a little bit from this because we have today, we have Social Security. You have, uh, you have your pension plans. You have your 401ks. At least you used to have your 401ks that you were so proud of. Look at that slowly erodes. All those things that are going on. And, and here in Bible times, they didn't have any of those programs. They didn't have, we didn't have government programs back 50 years ago or 70 years ago, whenever those came up. All right, so these government programs that are there, people took care of one another. We've kind of disconnected from that because, you know, dad, you got your pension. You know, you got your, you got your 401k, you got those things, and they didn't have that in Bible times. And so he's saying this, he says, uh, but if there's a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first put their religion into practice. Okay, your religion, put your religion into practice, mean taking care of one another, helping one another. She who is, she who is, look at verse five, she who is truly a widow. Okay, now I'm gonna give a definition for this of a true, a true widow and left all alone. Uh, what does she do? She, she sets her heart, or he, we could say he too, sets his or her heart or hope on God and continues in supplication and prayer night and day. First thing is first, but no matter what condition you're in, no matter where you're at, we're gonna put that before God. No matter where you're at, some of you have lost your jobs and, and there is that hope of those jobs coming back and all that, but there's this inner fear. What do we do? Gotta give that to God. God is not the author of fear. We gotta continue to give those things to God. I was just telling somebody earlier, and I've said it a lot this, this last week. I told a pastor this, a pastor friend of mine that was freaking out this last week, the same thing. He says, all of our Christian lives, we talked about the coming of the Lord. We talked about what's going to happen in the world as, a, as we get closer to the coming of the Lord. And now we're seeing it in real time. This should be exactly what we've talked about and, got, and we should be excited about. Jesus is coming back. Is this the end times? Well, go back a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about that. See, on Wednesday nights, we're talking about the book of Revelation. Is this the end times? Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll see you on Wednesday night. So here he says, here, we got to put first God. Put God first. He's the first thing. But the one that doesn't do this, uh, she is, who is self-indulgent, is dead. When they're self-indulgent, it's all about me. It's all about what do I get? You've offended me. You're not taking care of me. It's all about me. This will destroy that person. It says, she is dead 
even while she lives, it'll destroy that person. It'll destroy others around them. When we get it all about me, it's all about me. How do I, how do I get this? I think it's funny. All right, I'm going to be a little cynical right now. I saw the news article this morning, and it showed this person bringing back literally a warehouse full of toilet paper and hand sanitizer, trying to return it, and the store they got it from would not take it back. Ha! Take that and boop, boop. All right, so, but here's the thing is this, is that, is that so much greed came in, so much fear came in, all this stuff came in, and when it's all about you, oh, I got to get my stuff and I got to get what it's all about you. You're already dead. In other words, in other words, there's a death that comes with that. There's a misery that comes in that. When I look at it's all about me, man, I'm a miserable person because when it's all about me, then people hurt me. I look around. I don't like the way things are going. I'm always griping and sniveling about situations. It's not all about you, but when it's all about Jesus, hear this well, when it's all about Jesus, when it's all about Jesus, he takes all that away. He takes all that anxiety away. He takes all that, that, that it's, like, it's like poison in our souls. He takes that out of us. And what he said here at first, she needs to be that person that's a widow, a truly widow, she needs to be seeking God. The ones that don't seek God but are seeking self-indulgent, they're dead even when she lives. Look at verse 7. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. Command these things. Give them instruction in these things so there won't be those bringing accusations. Look at verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. He says the same thing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. The same, the same idea is there. You need to take care of your family members. Now, now... Um, Boy, there's a big balance in our, in our world today on this. We need to take care of one another, absolutely. But there's those that we take care of and those that mooch off of us and that need to go get a job. In fact, that's what it says in, in 2 Thessalonians. He says, if a man doesn't work, don't let him eat. Okay? You don't work, you don't eat. All right? We've talked a lot in our church about the brother-in-law on the couch. If you're the brother on the couch, we love you, but you're the brother-in-law on the couch. You suck all the resources out of the, out of the family and you, you got to go get a job. Go get a job, all right? So, so there's a balance in this. We want to help. Here's the deal. We want to help the needy, not the greedy. We want to help those, help themselves, but not the ones that are lazy. How about this? How about just in our own mindset? How about let's not be, and he's going to talk about some of this. If I shut up and read it, it's actually in here, is that if we, if we are all about ourselves and I am not, what are you going to give me in all, all this instead of what can I give? Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. I didn't even do the accent very well. Who was that? You should know that. Who was that? Yeah, he died. Yeah, but, but it was actually a really good quote right there. Ask not what you can do for your church. No, no, that's wrong. Boop. Ask what you can do for your church. Don't ask what the church can do for you. All right? Hmm. Well, that doesn't sound very nice, Pastor. Well, we're here for one. It's family. We're here for one another. But here's the thing. If we are all pulling together in times like this, if we are all pulling together and helping those that are having issues, having problems during this time, then you know what? It's one big happily family. Here's what we don't do, all right? And I'll get on this. I'm trying to do the whole chapter. I mean, here's what we don't do is we don't do this. We don't ever do this as a child of God, every man for himself. Every man for himself, I'm taking care of my four and no more. I'm taking care of my four and no more. In fact, let me, um, I'll hold on to that thought. Let me come back to that. I'm not done hammering that one. All right, look at verse nine. Don't you turn me off either. I'm not done with you. All right, look at verse nine. It says, let a widow, now listen, now listen to this. Let a widow be enrolled, okay, uh, if she is not less than 60 years, years of age, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation for good works, so let her be enrolled. Now understand, there wasn't the, the welfare system. The, there was no governmental welfare system in Bible times. There was a welfare system within the church. We learn that was actually established in, in Acts chapter 6. And so you have this system where they were taking care of the widows. And so he says, now in that system that you have, this is who you're to enroll in that system. 
It is the ones that are, they have to be at least 60 years old. And again, this is very, this is very much during that time period, but I understand the context of this. You got to take care of these ones because they don't have that, those programs. Um, man, wouldn't it be cool if the church got back to this? Tell you what, the LDS church puts the Christian church to shame in a lot of this stuff. You know why? Because they, they believe in tithing and you don't. How's that? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. All right, verse 10. And having a, rep, having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, have been serving one another, has cared for the afflicted, has devoted herself to every good work. Verse 11. But refused to enroll the young women, and when their passions draw uh, uh, them away from Christ and desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having a for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idle, idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what should not be said. Uh, so I would have young widows marry, bear children, manage their household, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. So again, it's, it's the practical roles. It's the young, the young need to pull together. Young, you need to get married and, 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 and you know, raise a family and do that. And that's his, his instruction. For the older ones that are, that are widowed, uh, those over 60, and this is the rule. So again, this is more of a, this, that's kind of awkward to even talk now about because here's the thing. This is more like a church behind the scenes church thing going on with the leadership. And this is what this is, a letter to, the, to Timothy, the pastor of this church. And there's, there's, this, there's this, this is how we're going to help. This is our benevolence ministry, and this is where we're going to help. And he gives the instruction there. And it's pretty self-explanatory. And the, hearts, the heart behind this is, is to not give the enemy an occasion to slander because some have already strayed from God to Satan. Some have already fallen away. All right, how are you guys doing? Doing okay? Let's keep going here. If, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Okay, all pulling together. So in their program they have, they're saying, look, if you have family, have your family needs to take care of you because there's such a huge need and we need to take care of the ones that really have a need. And that's the idea there. All right. Verse 17. See, we can get through this. Let the elders... Now, this is a good verse. You need to really pay attention to this one. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. 1 Corinthians 9. Take some notes. 1 Corinthians 9 is saying the same thing. He, kinda, he gives a little bit more to this. He says the same thing. Then he quotes the scripture here. Uh, the scripture is saying, you shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain from Deuteronomy 25. When the, when the animal's working, you need to feed the animal. And he quotes from Luke chapter 10, uh, the laborer deserves his wages. Okay, so you have this taking care of your church, taking care of your pastor. He even has a thing here uh, about don't, don't, you know, entertain a charge against an elder. And here's some rules on that. I'll get to that in a minute. But here he has this, here, taking care of the leadership within the church. Praise God for Calvary Chapel. This, this is a good church. We do well. But I know churches that don't do well with their pastors. Look, if you don't go to Calvary Chapel, uh, first of all, if you're in, in Utah, you probably should. But if you're not, uh, you need to uh, take care of your pastor. You need to pray for your pastor. This is not an easy job. This is hard. You know, whoa, I've, I heard people say this for years. Oh, isn't it nice? You only have to work one day a week. And I almost want to throat punch those people because they don't have a clue what it's like. Oh, it must be nice. You only have to work one day a week. Oh, it must be nice to, but we need to be praying for one another. Let me tell you now, this is, this is stuff, all of this, this, in this chapter is pretty, uh, it's pretty hard stuff if we don't get a foundation. If we don't back it up and say, here's the rules, here's what we're doing, here's how it's all going down. If we don't back up and say, we gotta have some, we got to have some foundation in this. What is our motivation for doing any of this? Hold your place here. I'm going to come right back. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to show you just um, a little section in here, specifically a, a, a one a, of a concept that we need to catch. This is the foundation. How do we do this? How do we take care of one another? How do we take care of the widows? 
How do we take care of our church? How do we keep tithing when it's difficult, when it's hard? How do we keep giving to the church? How do we pray for our pastor? And you got to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is, this is what it says. It says, when we, it says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, that in severe testing of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty, notice that, their extreme poverty, poverty, having overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Did you see that? They are extremely poor, and yet they're extremely generous. How do they do that? How do you, you're extremely poor, and yet you're giving generously. How do you do that? For they gave according to their means, and I testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor uh, of taking part in the and the relief to the saints. So they said, we want to give. We want to help others. There's a, there's a group that's, that's, that's struggling worse than us. We want to be giving to them. And they said, they, they earnestly pleaded for us, let us give to this. You have nothing. You're starving. Well, let's help these people. Look what happens. Look at verse 5 of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It says, and this, not as we expected, but, and here it is, underline this, highlight this, circle this, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They gave them some, this, guys, this is the way to get through anything that we're going through. No matter how hard it appears, no matter how impoverished in your physical, spiritual, emotional, how impoverished you are, here's the way to get through it. You give yourself to the Lord first. All that I have, God, is yours. All I have is yours. God, all that I have, I want to give to you. Boy, this is a good time to be doing those things. I saw this on Facebook. It said, there's a little sign that said, said, how will you come out of the quarantine? Did you see this? How will you come out of the quarantine? A, will you come out broke? B, will you come out divorced? Three, will you come out pregnant? D, will you come out fat? Tur, okay, that one's, that one's a scary one. E, will you be summer ready? Okay, I don't know about that. Or will you come out of alcohol, an, an alcoholic, right? And I, it was interesting to look down the list, the number one thing that people put on there, the number one thing. Can you guess what it is? The number one thing by far, 90% of the ones, of the ones I looked down, there's probably about 40 people that answered that. And some people I know in our church, hey, what'd you put that for? It was number F, an alcoholic. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. You better be careful with that. That's going to mess you up. Okay, how are you going to come out of this time? Um, I, I remember hearing, a, hearing somebody give a definition of what integrity is. Integrity uh, is who we are when nobody sees us. I am begging God in this time, Lord, help me to come out more like you, more in love with your people, less apt, and this is a good time to test this and work on this, more, less apt to freak out over little things. More, less apt to get all panicky or all mad at somebody or all messed up over the little things of this life. And yet we're going to trust God in this. How are you going to come out of this quarantine time? See, the Bible says that they gave themselves first. How are we going to do all that we're talking about in 1 Timothy? They gave themselves first to the Lord. And then they gave themselves to the project. Then they gave themselves to the church. Then they gave themselves to the thing God put in front of them. We give ourselves to the Lord first. Have we forgotten what it says? Listen to Philippians 2. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of us not look out only for our own interest, but also the interest of others. Have we forgot that's in our Bible? Listen to this. In 1 John, it says, By this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and that we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or in talk. Let's don't just love in our talk. We talk about love. Oh, good for you, Christian. We talk about following Jesus, but in deed and in truth. What is the truth? What is the truth? So many people griping about stuff right now. What are you doing to make it better? So many people griping about their situation. 
hoarding stuff, even Christians uh, hoarding things. And, and, and so, what are you, so what are you doing? What are you doing in deeds and truth? Lord, help us in this. This is not easy stuff. And when I look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 5, I look at all these things. He's saying that we need to be helping one another. Yes, I want to, Lord. Well, it's going to take this foundation. Listen, the foundation is going to be this. I gave myself to the Lord first before anything else. We're going to learn here uh, next time uh, that with food and clothing, with these, you shall be content, as he's going to say later on in this chapter. Actually, next chapter. Okay, with food and clothing, these, you ought to be content. Well, yeah, but I need toilet paper and hand sanitizer, and I need, I need certain kinds of food, and I need snacks. I need lots of snacks because it's snack time. And that's why you take your shirt off, take your clothes off, look in the mirror, all right? Even the dogs start to snicker at you, all right? So don't, you don't need to be snacking. Snacking is not your friend. And I'm saying this because I, I'm, this is my nemesis. I like to snack. All right, so he says here, let me go back over this. He says, um, dealing with how we deal with one another, how we deal with those that are, how we, how we not, deal is not a good word, how we, how we minister to those in various situations, how we minister to the widows, how we take care of one another. The elders the, the, that are worthy of a double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching, and he gives scripture, Deuteronomy 25 and Luke chapter 10. And then he says this, he says, do not admit, do not receive a charge against an elder except the evidence of two or three witnesses. Okay, don't get involved in a little gossip arena uh, towards your leadership, towards those in, in the church leadership. Right? Don't, get in, don't get in the middle of gossip. Okay? As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the, in the presence of God and in Christ Jesus and, uh, and of the elect angels, I charge you, to keep these rules without prejudice, okay? Doing nothing from partiality. You're going to follow God, let God lead you. Don't do it because of partiality or prejudice against some. Do not be hasty in laying on our hands, nor take part in sins of others. Keep yourself pure, okay? Don't, don't lay hands. In other words, don't agree too quickly with something somebody's doing they say is for God, from God until you check it out. Laying hands on someone is saying, I agree with you, I'm praying for you, I'm empowering you, and don't, because the Bible says don't lay hands on someone suddenly, meaning you've got to really make sure before you put your stamp of approval on something uh, as a child of God, you got to pray through that, all right? So don't lay hands on someone suddenly, he says. Don't lay hands on nor take part in sins of others. Don't be part of things that is, that, that is going in a wrong direction, but keep yourself pure. Lord, help us in that. No longer drink only water, but a little wine for the, for the, for the sake of the stomach and your frequent ailments. Young Timothy, okay? He, he's a guy that probably had some kind of nervous habit. He was a young guy. In fact, it already said, you know, uh, uh, in, in chapter 4, it says, let no one despise your youth. So he's a young guy. He'll say in 2 Timothy, he'll say, God has not given us a spirit of fear, young Timothy. God has not given us that spirit of fear. He's given us the power and love and of a sound mind. And he says, look, you can drink a little wine for your stomach. Say, kind of calm down a little bit. Drink a little wine for your, your stomach and your often infirmities. Now, you can, there's a couple, if you've got a commentary Bible, it's going to go all over the map on this thing. One of the things they're going to say, well, water wasn't like water today. Water it could, it is not necessarily, you know, pure. And so this is something that will help, kind of like a medicine, okay? I don't know. You want to call wine a medicine? I don't know. It'll mellow you out. It'll be cool. Let me just tell you, let me give you some parameters now so you don't become an alcoholic. Right, some of you that are saying, "Well, I can drink right now." Well, okay, whatever. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna come against this, but I'm gonna say this. The Bible does say, "Don't get drunk with wine, but be but be filled with the Spirit." The Bible says, "You don't go around drunk, so you're getting drunk." I know some of you. You 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 face you you text me at night and you've been drinking a little bit. It's kind of fun to watch, you know. Okay, so no, uh, the Bible says, "Don't get drunk." The Bible says, "Don't get drunk." All right, but here and 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 here's the thing. Now that's a top. I did an hour on that online with, with massive notes on, on drinking as a Christian. What does the Bible say? What is the historical background? What's the Bible say? Uh, you can find that in our online, in our Life of Christ series, and look at, it's when, uh, it was the wedding feast of Canaan is where I dealt with that in John's gospel, early on in John's gospel. So you can go online, you can see all the notes and all that, and then we can debate about it. All right, let me just tell you this. Here's some guidelines. Uh, 
is this. If you're getting drunk every night, you need to check that. You need to slow that down, right? That's not going to help you, Christian. That's not going to help you. In fact, when you come out of this thing and go back to work or whatever your routines are, that's really going to mess you up. So it's probably not the, not probably, it's not the direction you should be going. That's not for you as a child of God. That's not you for a child of God. And for some of you, you need, you need to not be drinking anything ever, you know, any kind of alcohol at all, okay? And you got to let the Holy Spirit lead you in that, all right? So... Pastor, that wasn't very clear. That's because you got the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit needs to speak to you on that stuff. All right, so he tells Timothy, use a little wine for, your, for uh, the sake of your stomach and the frequent infirmity. This kid was probably sick a lot. Let me tell you what, if you're in church leadership and you don't know how to deal with all the stress that comes in, yeah, you're going to have ulcers. All right, so this kid is probably dealing with some ulcers going on. Okay, verse 24. Heavy stuff, huh? Uh, the sins of some are conspicuous, um, you know, clearly evident. Verse 24, let me do this. Let me read this in uh, a different translation. This one's a little clumsy. Uh, let me read it out of uh, a different translation, starting in verse 24. Uh, remember that some people lead sinful lives, and every, everyone knows uh, they will be judged. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed until later. In the same way, everybody knows how much good some people do. But there are others whose good deeds won't be known until later. Okay, is what he's saying there. It says, you, there's some good things that's obvious. There's some bad things that are obvious. It's really all going to be revealed on one day. Everything you do, and, I, and there's some things that, that, that appear to be done good, but they're with wrong motives. And there's some things that appear to be bad, but they're with good motives. God, God filters all that out. I do a lot of things that are stupid, but I had good motives in that. And I praise God that he covers that. You know, I do some good things and I had some bad motives. See, I, see, that's where following Jesus, where he helps us in all that. He helps us in all that, right? One more little passage here and then we'll quit. Uh, Let all who are under a yoke of bond servants. Okay, this is kind of worker. In our culture, this would be a worker and employee situation. Uh, chapter, chapter six, verse one. Uh, regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so the name of God and, and the, the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the grounds that they are brothers. I can get away with this because you're my Christian friend. Rather, uh, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. I don't know why he had to put that in there. Oh, no, I do. It's because Christians don't always act like Christians. I did say this. I can tell you this. I did say this once when I was an employer before when the church was small. Uh, actually, this actually goes back to California days when I was planting churches. And uh, I'd plant a church. I worked full-time and I pastored full-time in California. And uh, I remember saying this and feeling kind of ashamed. I yelled it in a group of people. And I said, I will never hire, and I'm a pastor of a church. I said, I will never hire another Christian again. Okay. Why? Because, you know, and that, and that was bad to say, because that's not, that's not always true. I just have better, I have more, I have more, um, I have more, you know, I, I actually hold Christians a little higher than the world because you're a Christian. You really should be following Jesus and working. You really should not be lazy and trying to slough off and not doing your job. If you're a Christian, you ought to be, you ought to be witnessing your life in Jesus by working hard, by your, by your boss going, wow, look at this guy. This guy's a believer in Jesus. I see how hard he works. I want to know about his Jesus. And so it's all about this whole section. And that's as far as, look how far I got. See? See what happens when you're not here? See? <laughs> okay. So here's the thing. You got this, this whole section is about this. It's about how to interact with one another. It's about how to, to help one another in this life's journey whether it's good times or difficult times, whether it's a quarantine or where, whether it's a, a celebration time and everything's going well, whether your 401k, 401k is, is got a 30% return or it's 10% in the negative right now, all right? And I'm watching people get upset about that. Well, look at all the, all the gains that I made are now being eroded. Is that really next week we'll deal with you because he talks about finances in that. But here's the thing is that, is that when things are going well, are we, thank you, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I praise you, Jesus, and Lord, I want to help others. How about when things are not going well? Do we click into every man for himself, and do we click into being a little bit more spiteful towards God's people? Here, he's telling us, don't do that. And here, he's teaching us 
uh, that we need to take care of one another, and we saw the foundation. Lord, help me to do this. All of us, I'm going to give myself to the Lord first before anything else. I'm going to give myself to the Lord. Lord, I need to follow you. I need to trust in you. I need to see, pray with me on this, Lord, I need to see every aspect of this life through your eyes. I need to see how I interact with my neighbors and my relatives and my family members. I need to see this entire world, how I see my boss or my employees. Lord, I need to see this entire world through your eyes, Lord. How do I love those that are hard? How do I take stances that I need to make, stances I need to make, but do it through your grace and your mercy and your love. Lord, show me how to navigate these waters. I can't do this without you. Pray that with me, Lord. Pray that with me right now. Lord, I need you. I can't do this without you. Lord, help me to follow you. If you don't know Jesus, if you're not sure where you're at with God right now, Jesus, help me to know you. Lord, I don't want to be religious but I want to be yours. Show me how to do that. Pray that right now. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Lord, help me to follow you. Lord, I don't want to be inward focused. I want to be focused on you. You put it in your own words. Put it in your own struggles. Put it right where you're at. God, I come to you. Here's my issues. Here's my struggles. Here's the things that I'm struggling with. Put it right before him right now. God, here's the things that I'm dealing with. Lord, I'm trying to follow your word, and yet, Lord, here's what I'm struggling with. Lord, for some of you, Lord, I'm struggling with trying to get through this, and Lord, I don't want to come out the other side as an alcoholic, as addicted to anything, Lord. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's gaming that I'm starting to get addicted to. Whatever it is, put that in your own words. God hears you right where you're at. God, I want to only be completely absorbed in you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.